So um, the first speaker for today is going to be taking up the topic designing secure applications in the cloud. And that is by Adora Wadu. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> yeah, so Adora is um, fondly called, uh, she's called Adora. I'm just calling her Adora because yes, that's what I know her by. She is a software engineer based in Lagos, Nigeria and currently works at Microsoft where she builds cloud services related to artificial intelligence and mixed reality. She also She's also an author of the book Cloud Engineering for Beginners. If you haven't seen that, you can check her Twitter. It's, um, it's been there. It's an interesting book to look out for. And Adora has created a blog called um, Adora Hack, where she publishes um, articles on software engineering, productivity, and career growth. You might also want to check out her YouTube channel, where she posts content on useful software development tips. Over to you, Adora. Hi, thank you. Can everybody hear me, first of all? Yes. All right. Sweet cool. uh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, or good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Excited to be giving uh, this talk today about um, designing secure cloud applications. So yeah, let's get right into it. I heard Didi's story and it's interesting. I mean, I've heard it before on a Twitter space, but it's just interesting to hear again and, you know, to reinforce that. And to be honest, there are so many people like her that have, you know, transitioned into that space. And there's so many more people that would do that. And one of the reasons why is because it's interesting, and the cloud is also becoming really big, if we think about it. Um, the, apart from the fact that, you know, the cloud is like the bedrock for a lot of innovation nowadays, there are so many benefits to why a business would want to move their computing into the cloud. And there's some of these benefits that are listed here. You know, you can use applications as utilities over the internet. You can manipulate and configure your apps online. You don't need to install any any software to your local computer. You can use online dev and deployment tools. You have on-demand um, on self-service. You know, depending on how you are using the cloud, it can also be cost-effective for you in the sense that you pay for only things that you need. It's highly efficient, reliable, and flexible. And there's so many more reasons why you would actually want to, you know, do your, move your business to the cloud. But the truth is with all of these benefits and, you know, things that come with the cloud comes with some kind of responsibility as well. Yes, you know, if you are using um, Docker or Kubernetes as well, you will be able to do zero downtime deployment. So it's not because you are, you know, trying to deploy code that your customers would not be able to use your service, even if it's for a split second. You'll be able to do a bunch of amazing things. But again, with all of these things, because now everything is on the internet and it is public, publicly accessible over some network, there has to be some form of responsibility. And I want to play this short video. I really hope that my um, laptop can transmit sound as I'm screen sharing, but let's see how it goes. Hey there, I'm going to tell you a story about what happens when you do not protect public resources. This house has water supply in form of a bucket at the compound. This is a housemate who actually needs water. He gets some into his bowl and goes back inside. This second person who happens not to be a housemate comes to the public area where the water is and makes it unfit for everyone to use by washing her hands inside. This housemate happened to be walking in the direction of the water and accidentally kicked it. Now all the water is gone. Why did this happen? Because access to the water wasn't properly regulated. How do we fix this? Take the bucket away and keep it in a safe place. Secure the house, 
to prevent outsiders walking by from tampering with resources only meant for housemates. Connect a tap so that housemates get water in a structured way. The end. Um, the water was a cloud resource on the internet. Somebody has come and put what they are not supposed to put inside. Somebody has come and you know used it in the way that it's supposed to be used. Somebody came from nowhere and was just walking by and mistakenly kicked out the water and it disappeared. And now let me use data as let's swap this bucket of water with actual customer data. Somebody comes and washes their hands inside. Basically, an attacker comes and is able to corrupt your data in some way just because you've not protected it properly and because they can. Somebody comes and uses the data how they're supposed to use it, which is a normal regular user that needs that data, a normal developer that wants to fetch that data through API calls and has the right permissions or dozens, but just because they are the normal person, they are using it the right way and that's fine. Then a third person who is coming and mistakenly kicks the bucket and throws away the water, which is basically somebody else who is supposed to be using, or rather who is not supposed to be in that environment, but has access to that data for whatever reason, because it's not properly secure or regulated. And then they can just like delete the entire thing. Or even if it's someone that has permissions to do it, it could be someone that doesn't have permissions to do it, just coming to copy all your resources and then deleting it. Or it could be someone that has per that is supposed to have permissions to do it, but shouldn't have permissions to that level. And they make a mistake and they go and delete the whole prod and then somehow <laughs> all your data is gone. You know, things like that. There are some security risks in building cloud applications. The first one is, you know, human errors, human mistakes, which I just talked about, you know, somebody accidentally deleting all of the data because they didn't realize they had that had those permissions or because they wanted to delete something else and then somehow they went to go and delete the entire production infrastructure and now suddenly you don't have data anymore malicious attacks which is you know similar to um things like sorry malicious attacks which is you know similar to people um going to wash their hands inside the tap for example right um so people coming to your data and corrupting it because you've not properly secured it and the last one which is legal and compliance issues I mean, to be honest, there's no way you would tamper with a lot of customer data or use PII the way you're not supposed to, that you don't expect lawsuits from coming to you, or you don't expect security agencies when they do an audit on your business to say that you are not security compliant. And this can bring issues for you and could also possibly damage your reputation. So in this talk, you know, I would be highlighting the different architectural patterns for building secure cloud application and also some things that you can do outside you know software architecture still within your code as a programmer or a cloud engineer to also help you in thinking about securing these cloud applications but before we go deeply into all of this i would want to quickly introduce myself so hi again my name is adora and i'm a software engineer currently building mixed reality on the cloud at microsoft i'm also the creator of adora hack which started as a blog where I post content for software developers, grew into a YouTube channel or rather extended into also having a YouTube channel where I post lifestyle content about my life as a software developer, as well as content for software developers in terms of how to grow their careers, productivity tips, and all of that. And recently also included <laughs> a study group for people to ask questions and you know do peer programming together and learn sort of like, you know, having people come every week or every other week to answer all the questions that people have and, you know, facilitating sessions that force people to actually own their learning because now they have a safe space that they can get their questions answered. I'm also the author of this book, Cloud Engineering for Beginners. Um, it's a book that, you know, introduces the concept of the cloud, cloud engineering, different um, roles and job types in cloud engineering and you know different parts of the cloud 
to beginners in a beginner friendly way uh also on the advisory board for vrara nigeria currently trying to you know do some form of vrar education in this space advocate for the technology and promotes usage of this technology in different industries as we move towards you know building the metaverse and i basically live on twitter if you are on twitter you would know that i'm mostly always there and you can find me on twitter at adoran Wudo. so now let's get to it um when you want to start building your application one of the first things you do is you know to have a security checklist and this checklist actually helps you analyze and understand how your applications need to be secure. So it's some form of defense before you are actually even attacked, which in my opinion is important. And there are some of these questions that you ask yourself, which is, will my application contain um, sensitive data? Where and how are my application's data stored? Will this application be available over the internet publicly or will it just be available internally? How do I plan to verify my user's identity? What sensitive tasks are performed in my application? And does my application perform any risky software activities? Asking this question will allow you to be able to you know, think about your application security holistically. And when you ask yourself these questions, you can come up with answers. So if you're asking yourself, ah, will my application contain sensitive customer data? If your application does contain sensitive customer data or what is called PII, you would now go towards you know, thinking about identifying a data protection method for your application so that you can secure that data in transit and at rest. Where and how is my application data stored? You might start thinking about, you know, instrumentation to your storage services clients so that you know at what point you are starting the client, connecting to the client, storing the application. You entirely know the entire, you basically have a holistic view in your application about the entire life cycle in, you know, the storage bits and um, you can also think about data protection. So when you're thinking about where and how your application is stored, and you can now properly think about, about data protection in an effective way. Will this application be available over the internet publicly or just internally? So for public apps, you can be thinking about, you know, data protection methods. You want to make sure that people's data are protected. For internal apps, you might be thinking about, oh, okay, if this app is just available internally to maybe the developers in this company or on this team, you think about granting permissions to internal users. You don't want to give everyone super admin access. You want to make sure that the right people have the right access and no one is overprivileged, basically. You can be thinking about how do you plan to verify your user's identity? And that's where you'd have to think of a good authentication and authorization strategy for the application that you are building so that it's secure. What sensitive tasks are performed in your application? You might also be thinking about an authorization strategy that is very key because you don't want people that should not be able to perform sensitive tasks to be performing these tasks because you haven't properly set the right permissions. And then the final question, does my application perform any risky software activities? And if it does, like maybe down uploading, if you are going to be doing risky software activities, like allowing people upload things up into you know your infrastructure into your storage you might be thinking about protection against malicious data you might be thinking about a way to sign you know the data that comes into your storage before you make that data publicly accessible to many people because imagine people uploading data to your storage and that data is also supposed to be publicly accessible to anyone that is using the application so it's like oh okay i'm a creator i can put things here and I can also, and I can also, you know, I can read and I can write basically to your application or to your infrastructure. If you don't think about protection against malicious data, what's going to happen is that people can upload random things and they're not supposed to upload. If you've not thought of a way to sign that data, if you've not thought of a way to protect or rather to verify that data that is being uploaded, somebody can upload a malware and 
something happens to everyone's data and next thing people are calling you you're answering lawsuits and different things that you do not want and based on these questions that have been asked you can put them into two buckets the data protection buckets and the identity management buckets and in this talk today i'll be talking about three architectural patterns in these two buckets the first pattern is the gatekeeper pattern which is under the data protection bucket and the second pattern is the identity management pattern which sorry is the um federated identity and valet key patterns which are under the identity management bucket so now let's talk about the gatekeeper data protection scenario so applications functionality are usually exposed when they accept and process a client request so if the system is compromised and a malicious user gains access all sensitive data will be exposed so enter the gatekeeper pattern which is a way for the system to have a gatekeeper that validates and sanitizes the request before the request is actually forwarded to the service so that you can sanitize this request if somebody is imagine someone sending a query right somebody trying to just you know have a peek at your data steal your data and in whatever request they're making to your service it is a raw query and you don't check and validate or sanitize these things but you just let it go they are going to be able to even write queries that delete things off of your you know storage or your database if you've not set these right um, data protection policies in place and you don't implement this gatekeeper pattern that helps validate and sanitizes you know these requests so what happens with the gatekeeper pattern is that a gatekeeper exposes you know an endpoint to the client that is like a public endpoint and then the public endpoint is the endpoint to a gatekeeper, not the endpoint to a service. And after the sanitization and you know the validation is done, then a private endpoint, that is the call to the service, is made. And you know, with that, you can call all the different parts of the service, call your storage and stuff like that. So the benefits of using the gatekeeper is you know, request validation, limited risk, and security. And this is like a real life application of a gatekeeper pattern where there is a public endpoint, which when you call it, you have like a gate, it gives you a gatekeeper role, which is, you know, a limited privileged mode. And then once you are done validating and sanitizing, then the gatekeeper can call the internal endpoint. And in that internal endpoint, you have full privilege because now you have a trusted role and you can use the service or the application. However, you want to and the next thing i want to talk about is the valet key pattern which you know allows you securely control access to data by using a token that expires after a period of time so this token can be used either for authentication and authorization so let's say you want to access as a user me right as a user or a client or a customer i want to access your organization's storage because maybe i need like a read and write rule um to that storage because i'm supposed to be able to you know upload data onto the storage and then you know you would now help me process that data and then you know people can use it or i can get it back or whatever i would have to implement something similar to a valiki pattern which is where me as a user, I request a resource from an application and then the application validates the request and generates a token for me, returns that token back to me. Now that I have that token, I can now present that token to the resource and be like, okay, this is the token and this is the action I want to perform on this resource. And then the resource can validate that token and perform the action. Or tell me that the token is invalid so i will need to you know request another token or just know that i don't have permissions to access that resource and as an application i can decide to set policies where i can you know revoke tokens after 30 minutes you know add some specific permissions to tokens so that it's not just anyone that has a token that can perform any kind of action on the resource if i'm giving you a token that you know 
the claims on that token are only for read access. I don't expect you to be able to write any form of information to that resource and things like that. So this is um code that i got from the internet that explains this in like actual source code so i hope it helps you so doing this in like an azure storage account for example i have a blob service client and i have a blob container and then i'm like okay hey i want to get um shared access reference because i want to be able to upload data to the storage account and then i get the client for the blob which is like the storage account client basically and then i create a storage shared key credential so i say okay this is the storage account name and um this and i pass in the app setting as well for the azure storage emulator account key and then i build a i create like a bob a blob sas builder where i pass in my storage container i pass in the name of the blob that i want access to i pass you know the resource and also the time so if i want you know to create an access key that allows you know someone upload a file and i want that access key to be revoked after 10 minutes i can now you know add that okay my time offset should be 10 minutes so after 10 minutes if you're not done doing what you're doing sorry you have to request another token and then I set permissions because you want to be able to upload a file onto my Azure storage. I give you write permissions and then I create the URI and I send them back to you. And then now you can do what you want to do with that. So this is like a code snippet for that sort of thing. The third identity pattern that I want to talk about is the federated identity pattern. So this allows you, you know, set this allows you separate user authentication from application source code and delegate authentication to an external provider. A lot of people don't know that they do this, but they do this today. So if you are using, if in your application, you are not doing username and password, but you are actually using an external, you know, maybe social media sign on, or if you are using maybe Microsoft, for example, you are using Azure Active Directory or MSI login or um, MSA login rather, you are already doing this sort of thing. And this pattern works like, okay, I am using this identity provider or security token service as a service or as an application, which is like, oh, signing with, you know, this thing. And what happens is that I see, I write code in a way that, you know, users authenticate and request tokens. And then once they authenticate and they get those tokens, um, once they authenticate, rather, I send a token um, from a security token service back to the user. And then now the user can use, you know, that token or, you know, that, yeah, that token. It could be a JWT token or any other kind of token, a JWT, because people have this argument that is either pronounced as JWC or JOT. I call it JOT anyway. So it could either be a JOT token or any other kind of token sent back to the user and the user can present this token to the service and that can give them, you know, access to, you know, certain things in that application. So there are different, you know, use cases for this federated identity pattern single enterprise sign-on if you have multiple partners and if you're building software as a service applications. So this is like an example for, you know, using the federated identity pattern in a claims-based access control scenario. And imagine a SaaS application that, um, a software as a service application by, you know, a tenant company that is using this federated identity pattern. So I trust this provider. And basically, I, you know, can get a token from this provider and then use the claims to access whatever resources. And this helps me, like, protect myself from, you know, certain scenarios. So even within a company or, you know, even within, like, different providers and stuff like that, it's like, okay you ask you this tenant is different from like this other tenant and you know things are grouped you know like 
like different tenants and stuff. And basically, if you present a token that is not for my tenants, I can basically, I don't know, kick you out of accessing my resource and stuff like that. So I have talked about three patterns. So now I um, want to talk about other ways that you can enforce security. The first one is using multi-factor um, authentication. Um, recently, I've been getting like a lot of emails from like you know different things that I'm signed onto that um, um, as from this date we are going to be moving to two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. If you've already enabled multi-factor authentication on your account, you don't have anything. You don't have to do anything or you know perform any action. But if you've not before this date please go and enable it, blah, 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 blah. Because passwords are not enough these days, right? Um, people have been hacked. There have been a lot of security breaches a lot more recently than before. Also with, you know, you know, this whole remote work and everybody being at home, we have to find a way to secure ourselves a lot more than we did before because now we're no longer in physical buildings, you know, in our offices where there's like, oh, intranets and it's like you know secure and you know it's shared and all of that we need to find new ways to make sure that we secure ourselves and we secure um, all the things that we're doing in the context of the work that we are doing um, implement just-in-time access for resources as well um, so JIT access is like on a normal day as a cloud engineer you don't have access to cloud resources production cloud resources in your team but let's say you are an on-call engineer or you want to make a particular update to your application, you can request just-in-time access and then an admin grants you that access with certain privileges. So if you request just-in-time access for right operations, an admin grants you that access. So now you can perform right operations in production. And then maybe after like a certain amount of time, your access is revoked so that someone else you know, or at least another entity is aware that you are requesting for access for a, for a particular thing. Not that everyone just has access and then people can mistakenly do things they're not supposed to do. You know, use stable authorization and auth authentication platforms as well. Require authentic re-authentication for some actions like, you know, if you are performing financial transactions. For example, if you go to an ATM today, um, or if you're even using your bank app or something, and you want to transfer money even if you've logged in with your password right before you do you are required to right before you make that action you're required to pass a token or a pin or a password or something like these things actually help to be sure that okay this person is actually the person using this thing and i'm authenticating them twice to be sure that they are the ones and they know what they're about to do before they do it because once you do things like this I mean, nowadays things can be reversed, but they take a very long process. And sometimes, even to an extent, some of these things cannot be reversed, right? Um, reduce your attack surface. Your attack surface is basically the different areas in your architecture, the different areas in your infrastructure that you can possibly be attacked. So if there's, or rather, the different areas in your infrastructure that can serve as entry points for attacks, yes. So basically, if there is a VM that you are not using, go and delete it there's no reason why it should be there if there is like you know storage or anything that you're supposed to be using that you haven't used in a long time that you don't need anymore or anything like that um go and delete it like make that attack surface because what what happens to us as human beings most times is when we're not using some certain resources we don't pay as much attention to them and over time they get outdated and they become more vulnerable and then this can become problematic um Properly handle errors and exceptions for, you know, instrumentation and proper telemetry so that you can track what's going on. Monitor your services as well and trigger alerts about issues. For example, um, apart from issues like, oh, this service is not working, there are things that you can trigger alerts for. For example, people have been deploying code over the past, like, three weeks, but somehow people tend to stop at the staging infrastructure there's been so many changes made and so many code has been checked in over the last two weeks, but nobody has gone all the way to a production deployment. You might want to trigger that as an issue because the day you finally do that, you might be deploying changes of like five weeks 
into production and that might break something and there might be an outage so you might want to trigger these alerts as well to make people not just know about you know the health of your service but also not just know about you know the latency and you know speed and all of that but also know about the health of your service and things like that encrypt sensitive data in transit and at risk um and arrest rather implement fail safe measures you know so that if your application is actually failing it's failing gracefully and consider threat modeling threat modeling again is like a thing where like you can defend yourself before you know you actually get to the point where you have issues and it's just like you know thinking about your application and thinking about the specific kinds of threats that your application can have and you know thinking of a way to combat those threats before they become actual threats and there's this framework called you know the stride framework where um in stride there are six um different kinds of threats so if spoof spoofing attacks can be a possible threat in the application that you're building that is an authentic that is an attack on like you know your authentication and you might want to enforce things like https connections to make sure that doesn't happen if you know tampering is the threat it is a threat on you know the integrity of the software and you might want to use user valid ssl or tls certificates if repudiation is the threat you might want to think about enabling monitoring and proper instrumentation if information disclosure is the threat that's a problem with your confidentiality and you might want to encrypt all of your data in transit and at rest again you don't only encrypt um data at rest it's also important to encrypt data when that data is moving from point a to point b if denial of service is the threat that is an availability problem and you might want to enable monitoring and proper instrumentation i use the example of you know deploying to staging for like five weeks and then the day you finally go to broad it breaks so you might want to make sure that you don't have an availability problem so enable proper monitoring so that you know when these things are happening and you can combat them quickly also things like oh this particular storage token is about to expire this password is about to expire these are things that you should also do monitoring and instrumentation for so that you know that they are about to expire a month before they expire and you can you know request to get a new one as opposed to it being expiring or rather as opposed to it expiring your application being like you know out of service for some minutes or hours before you fix that problem um evaluation of privilege is the issue authorization is the problem and then you know using security identity management is a way to combat that issue other things that you can do use secure libraries update service dependencies to prevent vulnerabilities and avoid hard coding you know secrets in your code if you want to learn more about how to build secure on how to design and build secure cloud applications you can take a screenshot of this because these are useful links that you can um you know check out i would also tweet these links so you can check my account in a few hours on twitter i should have tweeted them by then um i feel like i am past time but i apologize for that and also thank you for listening to my talk i hope you learned something if you have any questions you can ask you can tweet at me and i will respond to your questions thank you Oh yeah, you can also ask me questions in the chat. I didn't realize I'm just seeing that. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and I will be happy to respond. Thank you. Awesome, that was an interesting session, Adora. Uh, I think everyone was actually enjoying it. Most of us didn't actually know when it was past 12 already. <laughs> um, we don't have any questions yet, but if you have any questions, like uh, she mentioned, you can, tweet at uh, her, her Twitter handle is at Adora Mwodo. She's very, very active on Twitter, so you can, I'm very sure you get a response when you ask your questions. <laughs>